So this next section, section 1.6, is the section on limit laws. This is going to give us a, a series of tools for calculating limits of functions. So I'm just going to start writing the laws. Okay, but before we uh, do anything, we assume um, for a minute that the limit of f as x goes to a um, exists. And um, let's assume that the limit as x goes to a for another function, g, also exists. Okay, so assume, so these limits exist. Exist at a. Okay, so the, the rules that we use for computing, for making our limit calculations a little bit easier, um, start uh, as follows. So here's, let's say, the first rule. The limit as, um, as x goes to a of the quantity f of x plus or minus g of x uh, is obtained just by, um, by taking the limit of f plus or minus the limit of g, which is equal to L plus or minus m. Okay. So that says that if you have two functions and you're either taking the sum or the difference of them, and they both, uh, they both have limits that exist at x equals a, then you can compute the limit of the, this new function you get from adding or subtracting them from each other uh, just by adding or subtracting the limits. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's do another example here. How about uh, or another rule? How about this rule? So so in this case, uh, c is a constant. Okay. So we have this constant c. The the law for calculating the limit of a constant multiplied by a function is well. It's just you just take the constant and you multiply it by the limit of the function. So that's Another rule we have is a rule for products of functions. So suppose that you wanted to take two functions together and multiply them and take the limit of that. Well, this is computed just as taking the product of the limits. So whatever the limits are of these two functions respectively, you can take the limit of their product just by taking the product of the limits. Uh, another rule here is um, I guess a consequence of, of this rule, if you just apply it over and over and over again to, uh, to one function, uh, suppose you want to take a function and multiply it by itself any number of times, so n is just a positive integer here, this will just be l raised to the n power. Okay? It's the same rule as this, really. Um, more limit laws. at four, so how about five? So the limit of a quotient okay. so this is exactly well based on the previous rules what you would expect it to be. It's just L divided by M as long as as long as M is not equal to zero. Okay. This, this limit may not exist if, if m is equal to 0. All right, more rules. The limit as x goes to a of a constant is equal to the constant itself. Okay. I'd like to think about this one for just a minute. Okay. Just think. Remember that, that the, the, the question of what a limit is is the question of what its trending behavior is. Okay, so if we have a graph of this function, so C, this is the graph y equals C, right? This is our function C. If uh, A is just a number here, then we're looking at the trending behavior. Okay. Well, take a look. What's the trending behavior of this graph? Well, the trending behavior, there is no change in this graph. It's just constantly at height c. So the trend is c, so the limit is c. Okay. Uh, just a little brief aside. Okay. Next rule. Um, this one we'll find very, very important. If you 
ask what is the limit of the function x as x goes to a? Well, the answer is a. So again, we think in terms of trends. What is the graph y equals x looks like? Well, it looks like that 45 degree line, of course. And, and if we look at the trend of this graph, um, as x approaches a, well, it's y equals x, so the coordinate here, the coordinates are a, a. So the trend of, of this function, of this function's values on its graph, is that when you're near a on the x-axis, the function is also near a. So that's just common sense. There are more rules. We can apply a previous rule to this, and that tells us right away that if you have x raised to any power, then you'll get a raised to that power. Okay. And similarly, if you have a root, okay, provided that n is a positive integer here, and um, and if if n is an even integer, then we we cannot let uh, a be negative because this. Um, the even root of a negative number is not defined, uh, and so this we would get um, this as an answer. So n is a positive integer. Integer I can spell, and a is positive if n is even. Okay, stipulations on those. So we have one more rule here. Where were we? Nine? How about ten? I don't care what you call these numbers, so I do not expect you to memorize numbers of rules. So if we took the limit as x equal or as x goes to a of the nth root of the function f of x now. So instead of just having x in here, we've got a function. Um, <clears throat> we can pass the limit directly through here. And I believe we were calling this limit L, so we get the nth root of L as our example. Okay, those are some limit laws. Uh, let's take a look at some examples. Okay, examples. Uh, let's calculate, let's do something simple. Uh, the limit as x goes to, uh, let's say, 5 of uh, 2x squared minus 3x uh, plus 4. Okay. Very, very simple limit. Um, if we graphed this, this is the graph of a polynomial, um, it would be very vi easy to visually inspect what this limit is. Um, let's, at least once in our lifetimes, use the rules for computing this limit. So I'm going to very, very quickly go through these rules as they're applied. And if you're keeping score, I'll try to use the numbers that we used before, just so that you can follow along. So the first thing I want to do is split this along these pluses and minus signs. So that will be using rule number one. So according to rule number one, uh, we have that this is the limit as x goes to 5 of 2x squared minus the limit as x goes to 5 of 3x plus the limit as x goes to 5 of the constant function 4. So that was just rule 1. Okay. Now next, um, I'd like to take this constant out of here and this constant out of here. So let's do that. So 2 comes out and we've got the limit as x goes to 5 of x squared and minus 3 the limit uh, of x as x goes to 5 and then plus this one stays exactly the same as x goes to 5. So this was applying, let's see, uh, we just took a constant out. I believe that was rule number two. Okay. Now, we've got the limit of x squared. So this is uh, applying rule number eight. We can just take five and put it directly in here. So this is two times five squared. So that right there was rule number eight that we used. Uh, minus 3 times, okay, the limit of x. This was rule number 7. We can just plug this directly in, plug 5 in directly for x. That was rule number 7. And then here, we're taking the limit of a constant. 
So remember, there's no x here, it's just a 4, so it, this does not depend in any way on the behavior of x, and so it will just, we'll get 4 here, because it's a constant. That was rule number 6. And if we do all of our arithmetic correctly, we get a number. This is 25 times 2 is 50, minus 15 is how about 35, plus 4 is 39. And so this is the answer. Okay, let's take a look at um, another example. How about the limit as x goes to 2 of the following function? 2x cubed plus x squared plus 1 uh, over, how about 4 minus 3x? Okay. So I'm going to look at this for just a moment. Notice it, the denominator uh, is defined when x is equal to 2, because if you plug 2 in, you'll get 4 minus 6. So that's definitely not 0. So, so 2 is in the domain of this function. And, um, and so that means, in particular, that we can immediately analyze this as a ratio of two limits. Right here. Now, if you think back to the example we just did, well, these are two polynomials. The last example uh, was uh, calculating the limit of a polynomial, and and so we get uh, so we should have a very easy time computing this using the rules. Um, it's a, essentially what you get is by plugging in here. So we get two times two cubed plus two squared plus one divided by uh, four minus uh, three times two. And this is some number, okay? Mm, just to be safe, let's compute it. So this is 8 times 2 is 16, plus 4 is 20, so that's 21. And then in the denominator here, we have 4 minus 6, so that's minus 2. So it's minus 21 over 2 is the answer, okay? So what did you, what have we observed from these previous two examples? Um, seems like when this number right here works for the function, it's okay to just plug it right in, okay? And that's actually always true. So there's a rule. It says if f of x is a polynomial or a rational function, I apologize for all of the out side exterior noise going on outside of my house today. It's just such a gorgeous day, so I've got the windows open, so I hope that you don't mind hearing my neighbor, um, whatever he's doing. Um, anyway, so here, uh, if f is a polynomial or a rational function, and if a is in the domain uh, then the limit as x goes to a of f of x is equal to just what you get by plugging in, okay? So you can compute a limit just by plugging in as long as the number you're, you're taking the limit at is in the domain of the function. Very good. Okay, let's see an example of when this doesn't work. but it sounds weird. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, okay, good. So we have, uh, let's compute the following limit. How about the limit as x goes to minus 2 of the function x squared minus 4 over x plus 2. Okay. Can't just plug this in, right? If you plug this in, you'll make the denominator 0. So we can't plug in. Minus 2 is not in the domain. domain of this function. Okay. Does that mean the limit doesn't exist? So does the limit not exist? So that's our question. The answer is yes. Well, 
I guess the technical answer to this question is, um, is no, the limit does exist. does exist. If you graph this function, what you'll see what you'll see is <clears throat> excuse me is a tiny well you, you might not see this hole there, but here's minus two Here's the graph of this function, x squared minus 4 over x plus 2. Um, here's minus 2 right here, here's plus 2. Um, it will look a lot like a line, it will be a line in fact. And um, if you ask yourself about the trending behavior here, then uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see that the trending behavior is that it looks like uh, minus 4 for there. And so in fact that's true, and so the limit does exist it equals minus four. Okay. So this is important. This is an important example. We couldn't plug this in. We couldn't plug minus two into this function because it's not defined there. Yet, when we graph this function, we see that there is a limiting behavior to this function that makes this limit well-defined there. Um, so that's a very subtle distinction. You can't evaluate, you can't say anything about a limit if you try to plug in and um, and you get no answer. All right, let me make sure that we're doing okay on time here. I'd like to go through uh, one more set of examples. And so I'm going to compute the following example. Um, how about the example 2 plus h squared minus 4 um, over h. So the question is, what's the limit of this as h goes to 0? Okay. Can we answer that question? OK, so let's solve this limit question really quickly, where we're taking the limit of 2 plus h squared minus 4 over h as h goes to 0. So you guys will all remember this. This is the slope of the secant line between a couple of points. It'll look similar to maybe the last quiz that we took. OK, in order to solve this, the answer to this question, um, we have to do a little bit of algebraic simplification. So I'm going to start off by expanding this. So we get 4 plus 2h plus h squared minus 4 divided by h. Okay. And now we're taking the limit as h goes to 0. Okay, So we can't just plug in. Notice if we plug in, we'll get 0 or 0. So that's not a viable option for us. So what we have to do is a little bit of simplification. We'll cancel these 4s. Four minus four is zero, of course, and uh, then we can cancel these h's. So that leaves us with this. Now, of course, using all of the rules that we've learned for calculating limits, this is just the limit as h goes to zero of the constant two plus the limit as h goes to zero of h. Well. Nothing happens to the 2, so that is just 2. And as h goes to 0, well, the limit of that is 0. So this is 2 plus 0, so this is 2. So the computation in this case gives us an answer of 2. All right, moving on from there, let's try to compute another example. So show that the limit as x goes to 0 of the absolute value function is equal to zero. So this is what we'd like to do. So you'll recall what the absolute value function looks like. It looks like a giant V. Looks like that. So here's the x and y axis, and this is the absolute value function. Okay. And the absolute value function is made up of two pieces. This is a piecewise defined function. So it's the function minus x if x is negative and it's the function plus x if x is positive. 
so let's say just greater than or equal to zero, because you just want to leave x as it is if it's positive, and you want to take the negative of it's negative to make it positive, because it's the absolute value. So let's um, analyze both of these. So what I'd like to do, the way that we, um, <coughs> the solution to this, the way that we solve this, is to show one, that the limit from the left-hand side of the absolute value is equal to zero, and two, that the limit from the right-hand side of zero is also equal to zero. Okay, so that's obvious from the graph, but here we're doing some math. So we're gonna, but what should be going on in your head, what you should be thinking is that as you travel towards x equals zero from the left, well, the function is going to zero, and as you travel to zero from the right, the function's also going to zero. So we can see that from the graph, but we're gonna prove it <coughs> using, using the skills that we've learned so far. Okay, so to do one, so why does this work, by the way? Right, we have the fact that um, if the, the one-sided limits agree, then the, the actual limit, so no restriction here on plus or minus, just the actual limit of this function is equal to zero. So this is the, the sort of the central concept that we're using um, by showing these two things. These will prove that the, the limit is zero. All right, so to do one, let's do it. It's quite easy. So the limit as x goes to zero from the left-hand side of the absolute value of x. Well, we've got it written down here. From the left, it's just this function here. So we have the limit of the function minus x as x goes to zero from the left. All right, well, that's a negative sign. It can just be pulled out according to our rules here. So we get this. And now as we go to zero, well, as we go to zero, that's zero. So this is minus zero, so it's zero. So check. Two. Did my cat just sneeze? He did just, he did he just sneeze again? All right, so my cat just sneezed a couple of times. I apologize if that bothers you. Um, all right, so here's, the next step in this process. Step two, we want to show that from the right-hand side, the limit is also zero, but this is exactly the same way. So we get the limit as x goes to zero from the right. When x is positive, the absolute value function is just the function x. Okay, so in both of these cases, we just restricted to what the function was here for that range. So from in the first example, from the left-hand side, the absolute value function is just the function minus x. And from the right-hand side, the absolute value function is just the function x. So again, it's a really simple calculation. This is zero, so check, okay? So since we've shown that the limit from the left and the limit from the right are both equal to zero, so the two one-sided limits agree, therefore we've um, solved the problem. So we're done. Okay, that's section 1.6.